Welcome back to HR and HQ. If you're Sarah, if you're me, I am live at Colonial Downs. It's Virginia Derby Week. Graded stakes action on a Tuesday. Normally used to this at Royal Ascot and European festivals and the Melbourne Cup, races like that. But here in the States, Colonial Downs doing us a solid. Sarah, Saratoga's closed. The action lives on in Virginia. Right. And I think this is the first time that you've filmed from the track. And it's also your first visit to Colonial. So looking forward to all of your thoughts on what the experience is like on track there. You said there's a pretty good crowd the day that we're filming, which is Monday. So that's great to hear. You're going to get to meet one of my favorite Twitter friends before me with Matthew DeSantis. So I'm a little bit jealous, but lots of action tomorrow. The Virginia Derby obviously highlighting the card, a grade three event for those three-year-old males. And you like a horse on top that I actually picked second. So I'll let you get started with why you like this horse. All right. Well, uh, first in general, like just first survey of the race, I see, you know, motion on the rail. Definitely a horse who figures to take money and deservedly so. Chad Brown trainee, unanimous consent, is the morning line favorite. I think it'll be a little closer at off time with Royal Patronage. Nevertheless, those are the two who are going to take money. I prefer motion. I don't really like Brown at all. And overall, I don't think either one has to win. So full field, a race that the simulcast land is going to be paying attention to on a Tuesday. Don't like the favorites. To me, that spells opportunity. And my opportunity is going to Capensis. Mm-hmm. Did I say it right? You said it as uh, well as I think that it's pronounced. Okay. But we could both number 10 off. is what's important when you go to wager. But uh, numbers wise, this horse definitely fits. And then trip wise, I'm not a huge trip handicapper, admittedly. First thing I look for is who fits on numbers, who's coming into the race the right way. Uh, but it's impossible to ignore the way this track plays or at least has this meet. I think there's plenty of speed in here, unlike the Oaks, which I'll get to at the end. But number power and the setup just points to the 10 for me. So it's uh, Capensis on top. And given the connections, I'm not sure about 8 to 1. But third choice, 5 to 1 or better, I'm comfortable with. Well, I picked this horse second because I see a lot of the same things that you do. I know we look at different speed figures, but the numbers add up with buyers as well as his maiden breaking score of 91 is the highest buyer speed figure that anybody has run in this field. He did cost $2 million as a yearling and had a huge dirt pedigree, which was enough of a red flag for some betters on debut as he went off at five to one. The problem is that last time out as the favorite, he kind of left his backers a little bit cold as he finished sixth in that race. So it's kind of the question of, can you make an excuse for that effort? And is there enough to suggest that he's going to run better in here And I think that the answer to that is yes, as looking for excuses, he did break from post 12 on the outer turf at Saratoga last time. According to our track trends tool, that's not at all where you want it to be. The outer turf on the routes was playing for the month of July, much more inside. And actually only one race was won by a horse from post seven out. And it was his race where the eight horse won that day. But he saved ground and was tucked in pretty quickly in there. He also sat a little bit closer to the pace. So with Capensis breaking wide and staying wide, going four wide on the both turns, you could certainly say that he was against the track that day. Unfortunately, though, with him being against the track that day, he's probably going to be a little bit against the track this day. As with our track trends tool for Colonial, not many horses succeed breaking from post nine out. And that's just why I couldn't put him on top. But I see a lot of the same things you do. And he certainly has a big chance in here. Yeah, and uh, admittedly did not go back and watch uh, the race back. I do remember that day uh, thinking even money seemed a little light, but that's a lot of confidence after dismissing him at 5-1 to one on debut. But uh, one of the speed figures I do use very much accounts uh, for ground loss and things of that nature. And given the uh, chart comments of being wide plus the solid number, Uh, That adds up to me, as you noted, uh, not too worried about where this one could fit against this group. And one thing I definitely do not like is, and normally you see it with two-year-olds is when it's most germane because they're going into stakes off just one or uh, off two or three career starts. I don't like the big 
step back after a maiden win, uh, debut maiden win especially, and this one did not take that. Yeah, disappointing to get beat at even money second time out, but numbers-wise, the performance was about where you would want, and now you get an extra half furlong being by Tappet. So plenty of reasons to like at a decent price, but you're hunting even bigger game. Well, as you said, you're against the favorite, and so am I, because unanimous consent, while he certainly can win, I wasn't too impressed with this horse in the Penine Ridge, and there's another horse in here that comes out of that race as well with limited liability, who did finish ahead of him and closed a significant amount of ground to a pretty glacial pace that was set by Emmanuel in here, but I'm going for a much bigger price from putting the eight on top with Camp David. He's 20 to one on the morning line. And this just seemed like a race where I didn't really want to take a short price. There's enough intrigue with some of these other horses. And this is a horse that is getting on the turf for the first time. However, there was some intent to do so when he did break his maiden last year at Keeneland in an off the turf race. He did come back to win the first time out this year as well at Horseshoe Indianapolis. Then they tried the mat win. He's just not good enough on dirt for a group like that, having lost to Cyberknife in there. We've seen what Cyberknife went on to do, winning the Haskell and then finishing second in the Travers. So it's not as though he hasn't been facing decent horses class-wise. And now this is a grade three on the turf. Their pedigree doesn't exactly scream that he's going to love this surface. <laughs> However, it doesn't really say that he's not going to do well on it. He's had the chance to work on the turf at Saratoga. He's first time in the Mike Maker barn. And this local jockey does fairly well, well on the surface at Colonial. He's sprung some big upsets before. I'm hoping that maybe this horse is going to be in a position early, whereas some others are going to have to come from very far back. I like that he has shown that he doesn't need the lead. He can sit just off because I think Grand David, the other David in here, is going to be the one that goes to the front. So I think with this horse, you get a little bit more pliability, versatility. He can kind of make his own trip. And he is a little bit more inside than some of these other horses that we like that are drawn just a little bit more to the outside. So I think he could sit the trip in here. And if he does well on the turf and anywhere near that 20 to one, I'm happy. Yeah. And uh, the jock, which you mentioned, certainly uh, one of the leading riders here at Colonial. But uh, interestingly enough, three for four when getting a leg up from maybe not Mike Maker specifically, but someone from his barn, uh, obviously very small sample size, but nevertheless, three of four, uh, Mike seems to uh, know who to call when he has a live one in Virginia. So uh, that kind of did stick out to me at, at, at a big price, even though I didn't love, but uh, just on back to unanimous consent, because, you know, we're pitching um uh, what many will feel I'm guessing is the most likely winner. Uh, even if not value is the favorite being from the Brown barn shipping down, but looking at Brisnet and I also looked at Ragazin, I haven't seen Colts neck yet, but this horse isn't even as fast as a couple of the others uh, in the rate, including Camp David, who has a lifetime best of 89. That's unanimous consent's lifetime best on Brisnet limited liabilities had a couple 90 pluses, they're like sometimes you say, well, yeah, I can win, but as the favorite, I'll try to beat. I can't even make a case for this horse if he were the third or fourth choice. Well, they're just going to bet the horse because it's Chad Brown coming into Colonial, and we know what kind of domination he has on the turf at other circuits. However, this is a connections play, I feel, and I don't really think that this is about this particular Chad Brown horse because, like you said, the numbers wise, he doesn't stand out to be three to one in a field like this. And you also have horses that have defeated him in here before, like limited liability. So why am I supposed to take three to one on a Chad Brown horse that's probably going to get bet down versus nine to two on a horse that's finished ahead of him before? This just doesn't make sense to me. Finished ahead and, and with better numbers. Now, the, the one I will say would scare me if I'm vulnerable for some reason, uh, but Royal Patronage, uh, definitely fastest via Brisnet anyway, mid nineties uh, speed ratings there getting Lasix, which is an interesting move for motion, 26% break, even ROI Rosario in for the Mount. If Lasix is an issue, there's a ready-made excuse. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. Brisnet classifies this horse as an E4, uh, which means pretty fast e is is early uh did not make the lead last time and actually pressed the pace two back so it'll be interesting to see what they do from the rail this to me is the most likely winner and at five to one i'm a little more interested but my sense is he'll be right there with unanimous consent 
Well, this one also drops in class as well, having faced some of the grade one type of company. I've tried this horse a couple of times now that this one has been in the States, and I just wasn't wowed with any sort of move that this horse made. I think on the turf, you either want to see them be close early or make some kind of middle move or have that kind of turn of foot that you would expect closing from the back. And I just feel like I haven't really seen a move from this horse. However, this is a softer group. And if the Lasix makes a difference and they try something new with this horse, he also is the only one other than Capensis that has hit the buyer par for this race, which is an 88 having run an 89 two back. So I understand that there's some things to like about this one. I just wanted something a little bit more juicy in the price range. No. What do you think of wow with a summer? I've never really been wowed by this horse. Um, I mean, I think that this one might want a little bit less ground than this mile and an eighth. Best races mm. were run at a mile so far. So yeah. I don't know. The, the 20 to one uh, is calling me, I, I guess, if, you know, I'm, I'm spread to a point where do I really want to be X deep against favorites and let this one beat me. The answer is going to be zero or no, but uh, I also haven't looked at the other, well, I've looked at the Oaks, but the other three races in the pick five. So I'm, you know, not really sure where yet, where my leans will be that if I can get to this one, but uh, would scare me a little bit as now that you've talked about it, Camp David and, and taking a second look just purely on numbers fits a little bit too. So that's a couple of 20 to ones between the two of us. You have one on top. One scares me, but uh, at eight to one, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, Capensis on top. Right. And if this horse is who he's kind of supposed to be, this should be a good stepping point to much bigger races for this horse going forwards. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a vote of confidence from Todd to ship in for a stakes off a loss, third career start, but uh, you know, they have to do it. So we'll see if he does, but it's the 10 for me, the eight for you. Any other thoughts in here before I, I give a, a quick pick in the Oaks? Um, I think that's it for thoughts in here. You have a couple of horses trying the turf or getting back to the turf as well. There is a race that was on synthetic that many of these come out of, but my pitch is kind of tossed that race in general. I just wasn't really impressed by it going forwards into this race. So I feel good about trying to get this eight somewhere in my exotics a little bit on top to win. And um, I, I'm also feeling very comfortable with getting rid of the favorite. Love it. Well, we're uh, certainly in unanimous consent on tossing the seven from the Virginia Derby and then a little zigzagging after that, but certainly some opportunity, I think, between the two of us, since we have some overlap on the 10 and wanting to beat the favorite. And the Virginia Oaks, the preceding race, uh, actually kind of similar to what we talked about here with some horses trying turf for the first time, including number three, Katish, uh, who has not been on turf and arrogate. His numbers, not as great on turf as the other surfaces, but the dam has thrown several turf winners and gets the plus from our buddy Jeff at charting horse value. So uh, definitely think Katish is in the mix. And then full count Felicia, uh, number five, I thought took a really nice step forward last out, stretching out from seven to eight. Now gets a further stretch out here at Colonial for the uh, Virginia Oaks. And last year, similar form cycle. The stretch out as a two-year-old was her best performance. So uh, if it happens again here, she's very much in the mix at 12 to 1. So giving a, a big look to the 3 and 5 in the Virginia Oaks and the 10 for me in the Derby. Remind everyone of your pick again. Uh, I'm going 8, 10, 9 in the Virginia Derby. I have yet to look at the rest of the card for tomorrow. Lots of focus on today's card as well as action. the <laughs> closing day. Obviously, you're there right now, so I know that you've looked at today's card. You put out your grid as well. But for everybody tuning in for tomorrow's races, they should also like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for future handicapping content as well. And any final closing thoughts? I don't think so. I know uh, you and I will both be in action in various ways. So you see our Twitter handle. Is it there? <laughs> down there. Close. Somewhere down there. <laughs> Follow us both. We'll have our picks up for tomorrow. Plenty of links to some good info as well at HRN. And uh, I'll, I'll take an 810 in the Virginia Derby. I'll, I'll make sure I have a little of that. And if you get to give out a 20 to 1 winner, that'd be great. That would be great. <laughs> but. 
proviso, if I'm live to the 10 and not to the eight for pizza, I'm going to cheer for the 10. Well, that's more than fair. But after this conversation, we know that you'll be adding some eight in your multi-race wagers. <laughs> Sprinkling a little eight. All right. Well, that's it from Colonial. Well, me from Colonial. Looks like you're at the office. I'm going to in HQ. Yeah. You don't bring that home every night? <laughs> the backdrop? Yeah. No. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> That'd be something. All right. She's be. Sarah. I'm Ed. We're HRN. And best of luck on Tuesday, Virginia Derby Day at Colonial Downs.